Today, we are delighted to be focusing our comments and uh, feature on one of our amazing scholars, Paul Mullins, and we'll get to learn more about this in a little bit. But first, I want to tell you who I am. My name is Steve Viweg. I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. It was our idea many years ago to have the opportunity to bring together folks from our community, our community at large, to talk with our scholars, our amazing scholars, whose work has a huge impact, uh, not only on academia, but in the community. So we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you'll have an opportunity to join us and to uh, learn more about the uh, impact of the work of our scholars. Our, our uh, program, our whole center is the brainchild of Professor Emerita Sandra Petronio, a professor of communication studies, who when, came, when she came to campus along with her husband, then Chancellor Bantz, noted that our campus is one of the more uh, uh, well-known campuses in the country for scholars whose work is what we would call translational. So it's interdisciplinary, it's generating or using generated knowledge to solve problems in the community and in partnership with those folks in the community who wanna make the world a better place. When uh, Chancellor Bant stepped down from that role, he became the executive director of our center and today continues encouraging folks to, uh, to expand this work. And we'll learn today that he uh, was also part of when he stepped down from being the chancellor uh, and into the emeritus role, the campus uh, support, has been supportive of a program called the Chance Chancellor Bant's Fellowship Program. And uh, Paul Mullins, and his partner, Sue Hyatt, were the inaugural fellows, and we're going to learn more about that work today. So as we get together, just a reminder, you all know you're familiar with Zoom, but please keep your microphones muted at this moment, and uh, please use the chat if you have comments or you want to make sure that we see a question, a comment that you want to hear later. We will have time at the end of our presentation to um, for folks to share additional comments or questions, you'll note that this session is being recorded for future viewing. So if you have folks, friends who couldn't be here today, they'll have a chance to see this later. And you will be receiving one of those post-event evaluations. So we hope that you will take advantage of that and opportunity to, to give us some feedback about this work so that we can continue bringing things that are important and of interest to you. If you haven't had a chance yet and you're interested, you can get continuing educations for this work now. If you go to the expand.iu.edu site that you'll be able to um, attend our entire series and be able to get credit for this. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. We hope you'll follow us on social media. We try to be present everywhere we can. If you'll go to Facebook, and we are on Facebook Live today, let your friends know. Uh, but of course, on Twitter, Instagram, and we do have a YouTube channel where you can keep track of the whatever recordings that we have in place. And we like to let people know about our partnership with the library and its program called ScholarWorks, because that gives folks an opportunity to learn more about the academic side and to be able to access those publications, those journal publications. And sometimes our community partners are even part of that. And so if you'll go to the website, and Nuri, you'll have, here we go. If you go to our website, you'll be able to um, click on, for example, Paul Mullins, who we're featuring today. And you can click on his page and find out more about his work. But then if you scroll down, you'll see the links to some of his uh, featured works that you could easily access without going to a journal or going to a library, but then be able to read that work right there. You can also go to his ScholarWorks page and find out more about him directly. And we appreciate this, this uh, opportunity with the library to share this work with you so that you all can see uh, what our scholars are up to. We have some upcoming events. Want to make sure you know just next week, we're bringing in our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Becker, and he'll be talking about student success. This is going to be a very interesting topic. You're welcome to attend either in person uh, at both events or virtually. On Thursday evening, March 2nd, we'll be having a community-based event. We'll be out uh, in the at the Bonner Center on the Near East Side. And on Friday, we'll be on the IUPUI campus, March 3rd at noon in the Heron Auditorium. If you're interested, go to our website and you can sign up. And next month, we continue our Scholar of the Month series, and we'll be talking with Professor Anala Tiemant, and that's on Friday, March 24th, 
at noon, and she's going to be talking about reframing teacher learning as a mirrored process of becoming. So you'll certainly want to join us for that event. Coming up, we can't, we can't leave out the opportunity for you to support this work in any way that you can. And so we participate in something called IU Day. And IU Day is a time that we can focus on the great work that happens and invite people to support it with a little bit of treasure. So please take a, an opportunity to uh, look at that and to share it with your friends if they're interested in supporting the kind of work that you're going to hear about today. So speaking of today, Today, our Scholar of the Month that we've been featuring all month is Professor Paul Mullins. And Paul is a, in the School of Liberal Arts, and he is a historical archaeologist who studies the intersection of um, uh, materiality and the color line, focusing on the relationship between racism, consumption, and urban develop displacement. And um, Paul, as I mentioned, is what our inaugural a uh, scholar who is uh, in the fellowship program that was uh, named under Emeritus Chancellor Vance, and he and Sue Hyatt, who will be sharing some of the impact of his work on her, will be highlighting what that fellowship was all about. Um, but we have several speakers here today who are going to just talk about the impact of work, because one of the amazing things about our scholars is um, it's not only the work that they do with themselves, but it's with their partnership in the community and with other folks and how they inspire and help folks to expand their own work. So we have a series of folks today who are going to talk very briefly about how Paul's work has impacted them. So we have a better sense of the work that he has done over these years, which fits right into our idea of Scholar of the Month. And to kick it off, you'll hear from Chancellor Emeritus Charles Vance, who will just give an uh, overview of what the fellowship program is about and how Paul and Sue, who's the second speaker, were named as the uh, inaugural fellows. Uh, so Sue will share some of the information about her experience. That'll be followed by Rhonda Henry in the School of Liberal Arts, who talk about her imp how his work has impacted her work, followed by Professor Edward Curtis, also in the School of Liberal Arts, Holly Cusack McVeigh, again in liberal arts, and you'll see from different perspectives. And then we'll have Liz Kreider Reed, who'll talk about her perspective. And, and you see that we have religious studies, anthropology, and others. And then we'll have a couple more folks who will share their information from uh, informatics, Andrea Copeland. And then finally, we'll hear from Rebecca Schrum, who's got a history perspective. And so we are so delighted to have this opportunity today. And we're going to kick it off now and invite Chancellor Emeritus Charles Vance, the executive director of our center, to kick off this uh, discussion about Paul's impact on our work. So welcome, Charles Vance. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, and uh, thank you, Nuri, but thank you all for coming. What a terrific opportunity for us. <clears throat> Forgive the frog in my throat. I'm here with Sandra Petronio, who one of you know is my wife, but it was her idea to create a trip center. And this, in fact, event was in one of the dreams that she and Steve cooked up uh, more than a decade ago. And uh, strangely enough, the pandemic made it happen uh, in a way that really has worked for us. Uh, thinking about this uh, event today, I came back to uh, and the photo brings it to home. One of the appeals of IUPY for many of us on the screen, and I flipped through quickly, and, and I can really say that is true for so many of you on the screen, is that IUPY is centered in a community. And it is very obviously connected in that community in many ways, from disciplines through the students and faculty and staff, and Sandra made this observation with me one day at driving home that this is the most translational place that we had ever been. And that's what really set off on a recognition, a sort of a self-recognition of what the campus was. And it is a campus which has always had faculty who do work that connects to the community. And it has had students in the community doing that kind of work. It has had staff who, uh, it is literally part of their job. Uh, the library, for example, has uh, always placed itself as a public library in the center of this, this city. And Paul Mullins, 
is one of those people who demonstrated so deeply in the substance of his work, his historical archaeology makes me smile because my first really long meeting of any kind with Paul was he invited me to the dig on the site of the campus center. And it was an interesting dig. Some of you have been there around and I see a couple of people smiling at the thought of it as there was a dumpy old police station in a brick building uh, that was there next to the parking garage. And uh, Paul and the students he was working with were excavating and they found wells and the site of a two-story outhouse and uh, houses and frankly, really revealed to me the sense of the physical sense of the city that was disappearing and had been disappearing. And Paul, at that moment, I realized was in the very best sense, a voice. He is a voice for people who aren't there anymore. And that turned out a decade later uh, to be the theme that he and Sue put together in the Invisible Indianapolis. And I won't say more about the project because you'll hear about it from Sue. But what Paul demonstrated time and time again was that he was willing to, forgive the phrase, channel the voices and experiences of those before us. And he was willing to express his interpretation and his beliefs about those activities in history uh, to people who some people thought had more power than he did. In other words, he was a voice that you needed to hear and he was willing to articulate it. I recommend to you to look up the blog for Invisible Indianapolis if you ever want a really good read, but make sure to give yourself some time because it's in, it's uh, hard to stop uh, reading it. Uh, and that voice from Paul really came to a height for me early when he, thanks to Amy Conrad Warner's efforts and Glenn uh, White, produced a price of progress, which were narratives from community members in our neighborhood uh, in the historical past. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing read to hear how people viewed what was happening in their neighborhood through their lives. So he's a voice and you're about to hear a lot about that. And so I'm not gonna say much more than I was so thrilled when he and Sue were the first Vance Fellows I sat in on that meeting and for that discussion, and it, I've been in a lot of decision-making meetings. This was a decision that was really straightforward for that committee. It was such a great idea. And I'm really pleased to say that you're about to hear from Sue Hyatt about that. So you won't hear any more from me. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, um, Chancellor Bance, for that generous introduction. So um, I think we can move to the next slide. Um, so I, I, as uh, the chancellor indicated, one of the highlights of my time at IUPUI has been working with Paul in 2016 and 2017 on Invisible Indianapolis, uh, which was, we are proud to say, was the inaugural Vance Fellowship Project. Um, if you uh, see on uh, the picture of us with Chancellor Vance, that's the day that we received the official award at the uh, Chancellor's Award Ceremony in spring 2016. And you might wanna look and see my red shoelaces, which I see are very prominent in the photo. I, I cannot hold a candle to Paul's fashion sense, that we all know. And I'm sure everybody was is familiar with his uh, wardrobe of paisley shirts. But after I had come to, to Indianapolis, um, I started working on a project on the South Side that was a historic ethnography about the Jewish immigrant and black communities who lived there together, side by side, went to school together, um, shared bonds of friendship uh, from the early 1900s up until the post-war period. And in and of itself, that was a very kind of Paul-esque 
sort of approach to looking at neighborhoods. So when we decided to apply for the Bantz Fellowship, we decided to apply uh, joining both Paul's work on the West Side, which Chancellor Bantz has already mentioned, and my work on the South Side, because they were both neighborhoods that in similar ways had become invisible in the public eye. So I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is one of Paul's slides. And uh, as Chancellor Bantz noted, um, Paul's work on the history of the campus has, has been a conversation that was probably long overdue and that really needed to happen. When I asked Paul where he thought his work had had the most impact in Indianapolis, he said definitely on the campus and in the way that the campus now thinks about itself. And I completely agree with that. He, he, he met, said to me, when I arrived on the campus 24 years ago, I unleashed a conversation that was waiting to happen about the campus and about the history of displacement, um, end quote. And um, the parking lots in particular, I think, are emblematic of that process of making spaces in, invisible. And when I look at the parking lots now, and I think anyone who knows Paul's work looks at the parking lots, we don't see cars, we see people that are missing from that landscape. Next slide. And uh, this is one of my favorite Invisible Indianapolis blogs. And it's also, I think, one of the most poignant. Paul knows that I always talk about this story of Mr. Yeah. Ira Johnson. Sorry? Oh, I thought somebody was saying something to me. Um, the story of Mr. Ira Johnson, who moved on to 311 Bright Street in 1944 and lived there till his death in 1974. Next slide. And um, the obituary that Paul found about Mr. Johnson was so poignant. And as you can look and see, his obituary states that after the uh, campus construction began, he did, quote, he did not like the noise, the machinery, or the people moving about. He liked it even less when a parking lot came up to his back fence. Uh, that's just a little excerpt. And so I think for all of us, it is one thing to document a process that we might rather dispassionately describe as displacement, but it's entirely another to imagine a Mr. Ira Johnson forced off sitting on his own porch in his old age by all the commotion that was taking place around him. Um, next slide. So Ms., uh, one of the commitments and requirements of the Bantz uh, Fellowship is public engagement. And of course, Paul and I have both long been proponents of, of public uh, presentations and public involvement in our work. And so our first event that year was for Spirit in Place, was uh, Homes Before Highways, Communities Under the Exit Ramps. And it was at the Concord Center. And it was the story of how the South Side was disrupted by I-70. And we had about, uh, I think, 100 people come to that event. Next slide. And uh, we were very fortunate that year because totally, you know, by chance, the uh, National Council on Public History held their annual meeting in Indianapolis in spring 2017. And we organized a series of events for that conference, including a bus tour, which was narrated by our Southside elders and a, a, a pop-up exhibit about con tailoring that had been a very prominent business in Indianapolis in the first, sorry, in the first half of the 20th century. And um, one of the funny things was when the elders, we toured an apartment building that's at the corner of St. Clair Street and Capitol that was the old con factory. And it's now very upscale apartments. And the elders were very horrified to hear how much those apartments rent for now because they remembered their impoverished parents laboring there in the factory to make the clothing for cons. Next slide. Um, our, one of our, our events was Discover Indianapolis, uh, a Discover Invisible Indianapolis, which was a one day workshop. You can see Dr. Henry, we we're pleased to have her participation and a panel of elders from the West Side and the South Side. And we taught people how to use the tools that Paul knows so well uh, to, to do the invisible histories of their own communities. And I think the last slide is now. So um, 
at, at one of the highlights of that year wasn't really planned, but it worked out, which was in August of that year, I got to go with Paul to Olu, Finland, where he has regularly taught a summer school class. And that year we taught it together on material and ethnographic perspectives on heritage research. And you can see us on the right there working extremely hard, enjoying some wine and I believe dried reindeer with our host, Timo. Um, so in conclusion, I would just say how uh, all of us have benefited from our collaborations with Paul. He taught us all how to use archives, interviews, maps, and other digital resources to explore how our reconstructions of the past can be, cannot just be used to understand the past, but I think this is a really important point, that they can be used to promote and bolster local movements aimed at social change and social justice. As Paul has always said, storytelling is the creative part of scholarship. And in the end, it's the stories that we find and that we share that make the biggest impact and that make the invisible visible. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here and it's great to have been asked to be a part of this panel to speak about Paul's impact on me. And so my discussion is going to be uh, not only about uh, Paul's impact on my work, but also about Paul's impact on me personally. And so I begin with this slide because this is how I always think about Paul's work. His work always uh, uh, speaks to me of, of an emerging sort of invisible uh, population or space. And this is a sculpture of Michelangelo, one of the prisoners or slaves. Um, and it's in the Academy in Florence. And I got to see this at, at one point in the early 2000s. But for me, as born and raised uh, person from Indianapolis and from Black Indianapolis, this sculpture speaks to what Paul's work does, which is to allow invisible populations, uh, my family's uh, history, as well as the histories of so many families in Indianapolis to emerge out of the dirt or out of the rock or out of the locations that many times don't really speak to who was there previously, but speak very much to those of us who remember and who are descendants of those folks who were there and who heard the stories, but have never seen those stories portrayed or, or paid attention to in scholarly spaces. And so for me, Paul's landscapes, and you can advance to the next slide, Paul's landscapes like Ransom Place or like uh, Madam Walker, they, they stand out, yes. But what really speaks to me is the stories, as, as Sue was talking about, um, those invisible stories that took place in these spaces. And my family, you know, went down to Indiana Avenue to, to take part in the performances of the Chitlin Circuit when the artists would come, my grandfather and grandmother. Um, I had friends who lived at Grandview and in Fox Hill, the Golden Ghetto. And I also, my grandfather was displaced a couple times by the highway. And so being born and raised in Indianapolis, these spaces already spoke to me. So then when I met Paul, right, I was so psyched to hear that his research was about that. But what really impressed me is when I saw how he interacted with those Black elders and, and is one of the reasons why I don't so much want to focus as much on the locations as the people, as the, the, the elders who were there that Paul spoke with to, to gain the stories and, and Sue as well. Sue's work is wonderful too and goes right along with Paul's, but he spoke to these folks and these folks were the ones that opened up to him, but he respected them, but most engaging was they respect him as well, right? And so again, this interchange, this, this connection where Paul sort of locates himself to make the invisible stories of Black populations in Indianapolis visible is where I kind of want to locate myself because that is really what had the most impact upon me. And so again, Paul's ability to, you know, one of the first times I met him, 
he sat down at a computer and he asked me a few questions about my family because I started to talk a little bit about them and how my family had lived at Lockville Gardens or how, you know, they've been around these places where he was actually sort of studying and excavating and making visible this history and sort of honoring my ancestors, my grandfather, my grandmother, my people as we live. And again, so many other black families as well, right? But anyway, he sat down at his computer and in a few minutes he could locate the slave schedules. He could locate some of the census that were about the Moon family, which is one of the families that I'm descended from uh, in Georgia, uh, in Georgia and, and partly in Alabama. And so again, the populations, the black people that he made visible, the people that he spoke to, the people that he respected, reminded me so much of the respect that I had for my grandfather and my grandmother and the stories they used to tell. And to see that then translated into the work that Paul did was just amazing to me and has influenced my work so much. Paul's, again, his respect, the ways in which he sort of critically thought about the position of the scholar in relation to the populations and the community experts that he spoke with, spoke to me so highly that one of the things that we began to do with the program I direct, which is the Alanian Scholars Program, which is the undergraduate research program in Africana Studies, was to change the research that we did so that it was community engaged as well. And so now, most of our students work on community engaged work and we um, honor and, and we respect our community participants so much when we think about the work that we do. But again, based in what Paul showed me and what Paul has done. And it's one of the ways that we keep the, our students engaged and we also ensure that our students understand the importance of their research. So thank you, Paul. You're wonderful. You're awesome and you have had such an impact on me i will always think of you in that way thanks so much thank you very much dr rhonda henry it was wonderful to hear from you where well, some of us are seeing each other we haven't seen each other for a while um my name is edward curtis like it says on the screen and um paul mullins helped to change my research to direct trajectory. I was um, trained in the 1990s as an analog scholar. And um, it was um, Paul who mentored me and um, who taught me, as, as Sue Hyatt pointed out earlier, how to um, effectively uh, use digital resources like Sanborn insurance maps, city directories, um, US census data, and other things in order to um, very much excavate the lives of, um, of people who are now gone and, and who didn't necessarily leave um, a, a lot of written materials. And Paul's uh, in, encouraged me to begin to use these tools to look at um, Muslim populations in Indianapolis, and that resulted in a couple blog posts on invisible uh, Indianapolis, but it did more than that. It started to enliven my imagination about what was possible. So using the tools that, that Paul um, uh, taught me, I then um, wrote a book about uh, Muslim settlers in the late 1800s across the Midwest. And then I decided to engage eight other student researchers in trying to document the forgotten past of Arabic speaking people in uh, Indianapolis. And it was, um, I was still having trouble at that point reading all of the maps. And it was Paul that helped me put a finger on the fact that our first neighborhood, our first Arabic speaking neighborhood in Indianapolis was uh, located in the same spot where Lucas Oil Stadium, the home of the Indianapolis Colts, sits today. And, uh, and, and uh, I ended up working with those eight students uh, to, to, uh, few, to gather the data to be able to make a documentary film, uh, to write a book, to do lesson plans. You can see many more products at ArabIndianapolis.com. 
And I want to show you, I also decided to feature Paul in our documentary film, in our PBS documentary film. And I want to end by showing an excerpt of my interview of Paul for that film. I wanted to learn more about what life life was like for these early Arab immigrants in Indianapolis. I asked Professor Paul Mullins to help me understand it. Paul is an urban archaeologist who has spent a lot of time studying Indianapolis history. How big a part were immigrants of the city in 1900? Well, there's a perception of Indianapolis as being, and Indiana as being kind of homogenous and usually that's code for mostly white. But there's always an enormous amount of diversity in Indianapolis, but it often is relatively modest populations, Arabs, overseas Chinese, Italians. There's a very large German-American community, of course, by the mid-19th century. We truly are a diverse community. In 1903, the Indianapolis Journal declared that Willard Street was the dirtiest street in the city. I mean, what was it like to live just in the south part of downtown then? Part of that is rhetoric. It's racist ideological rhetoric that's being projected on particular kinds of communities. They might be black, they might be immigrants, they might be religious minorities, they might be all of those things, actually. It also ignores that all early 20th century cities are actually enormously dirty. Most of them do have a fair amount of heavy industry very close by. You know, there's not paved streetways. There's not modern sewer service. There's not utilities. You know, this is what the American city looks like in almost everywhere, not just Willard Street. If I mm, take a step outside my uh, apartment or my house on Willard Street, and you know, I breathe in uh, a big whiff of air, what's it gonna smell like? On Willard Street, like every other street, frankly, in Indianapolis, especially downtown, we would have, first of all, smelled coal ash and wood ash from um, wood burning and coal burning stoves. We certainly would have smelled a variety of odors wafting over us from Riverside Industry. One of the largest pork packing plants on the face of the planet was along the White River where Victory Field is today. There are metal factories, there are grain factories. There will be an auto plant on the west side of the river. We would have had all of the odors of industry, but this is what most cities with an industrial base look like in the late 19th and early 20th century. No wonder perfumes were so popular among the, uh, you know, among the peddlers. That's a good point, actually. <laughs> they, they, they love With his witty banter, relentless teasing, and a biting sense of humor, Paul constantly reminds me to not take myself so seriously. Upon our first meeting back in 2012, we found common ground in our disdain for Spike TV's reality show, American Digger, and its debuted episode, where Rick Savage and his crew digs Alaska in pursuit of buried treasure from the gold rush era. Among the finds, a bear trap, a pick head, a gold pan, and a two-man saw. As my first anthropology chair, Paul understood and valued my role as a public scholar whose research is centered in collaboration and social justice. In practicing anthropology and the politics of engagement, Paul wrote, quote, practicing anthropologists are among the most powerful champions of engaged scholarship, end quote. Within weeks of my arrival at IUPUI, he was pushing me to identify course loads and scholarly goals with tenure in mind. Several summers later, he would track me down during field work in remote parts of New Zealand, steering me through the P&T process from the other side of the world. When in 2014, the FBI seized looted artifacts and the human remains of over 500 individuals from a collector in Indiana, Paul Mullins, past president of the Society for Historical Archaeology, was the first to define this as a human rights issue. In his blog post, The Morality of Property and Cultural Patrimony, he wrote, quote, 
After a news conference this week, the blogosphere theatrically lit up with property rights defenses, conspiracy theories, racist xenophobia, and attacks on the president, end quote. Paul went on to say, quote, this avoids the moral issues at the heart of this and many more cultural patrimony cases. Human remains, mortuary artifacts, and unique culturally specific artifacts have been reduced to the status of property, no different than any other thing, and accorded no dignified treatment or preservation informed by descendants, end quote. Paul's scholarship has also had a significant impact on my research in Alaska. Moving beyond a land escaped, the land and the spirit inhabitants are actors. But in the wake of colonization, there are absences, voids that cannot be ignored. In his 2021 book, Revolting Things, an archaeology of shameful histories, repulsive realities, he notes that, quote, places are consigned to a conveniently distant past, end quote. During the pandemic, I served as a discussant for a session with international scholars exploring place. There, I encouraged presenters to consider the literature on absence, specifically Paul's 27 work, The Optimism of Absence, an Archaeology of Displacement, Effacement, and Modernity in which he examines a post-war period characterized by the destruction and redevelopment of American cities, including Indianapolis. Paul encourages us to, quote, confront why specific landscapes are now voids, illuminate how such absences lurk near the surface or just below awareness, end quote. In 2022, the American Anthropological Association encouraged discussion of past, present, and future unsettlings of the world, including considerations of environment, power, as well as collective efforts to disrupt oppressive structures. In Entangled Landscapes, my colleagues and I explored transformed landscapes and the ontological worlds that go along with them. Pushing me beyond easy narratives, the work of Dr. Paul Mullins encourages me to rethink empty spaces and vacant places. He reminds us that, quote, landscape absences and the material traces such spaces harbor provide potentially compelling places to illuminate, interrogate, and acknowledge contested dimensions of the very recent past, end quote. This understanding opened a larger dialogue with me and with my colleagues working in Cambodia and Thailand. In Alaska, his work urges me to look beyond ancestral places to fish, hunt for seals and gather plants, but also to places where smokehouses, fish drying racks and entire villages once stood. Those potent landscapes, speak absences, speak volumes, in a place now designated a pristine, untouched national park. Paul, you are an important mentor, a valued colleague, and a dear friend whose work undoubtedly will continue to shape my own. Thank you for your continuous encouragement and that push to finish my book. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> of the many, many ways that Paul's influenced my work, I'm going to focus today on the power of objects to tell stories. Paul and I go back to our days in Maryland in the late 1980s. We were both working on sites in Annapolis that would become the basis of our dissertations. And Paul, seen here on the upper left, sporting some signature 1980s fashion looks, was working on three domestic sites as part of his study of, and I quote from his dissertation abstract, the relationship between racial ideology, material consumption, and African America's struggle to secure civil and consumer privileges between 1850 and 1930. I was excavating an 18th century terraced garden. 
Now, landscape archaeology is fascinating in many ways, but recovering a lot of artifacts is not one of them. I was thrilled by things like soil stains seen at the lower left that were made by the shovel divots and drainage ditches when this garden was constructed. Heady stuff. Needless to say, Paul, the consummate material culture specialist, took great enjoyment teasing me about our lack of artifacts and pointing out the rich assemblages he was working with. Now, fast forward to May of 2002, Paul had joined the anthropology department in 1999, a year after me, and had already launched an ambitious archeological project on campus, as we've heard. When we had the opportunity to create a temporary exhibit for the brand new Indiana State Museum opening in White River State Park, it seemed like a perfect opportunity to showcase his work. We invited Owen Dwyer, another fairly new faculty member to join us, and you can see our youthful innocence. Now I would make a different choice if I had it to do over, but we titled the exhibit, Do You See Race in the Case? And the concept was to use five different objects or sets of objects from Paul's excavations in the near west side to illuminate issues of race and racism. We were ambitious, if nothing else. I want to be clear that this was a self-designed, fabricated, installed, low-budget project. I think we had $500 from the dean for printing and supplies. So I had pretty low expectations for how it would be received. But to be honest, I was coming up for tenure the next year and really needed this exhibit project. Fortunately, Paul's intellectual work far exceeded the production values. We used this brooch and personal care products to address the history of racialized beauty standards. We used buttons and pins along with the powerful poetry of Mari Evans to talk about the economic roles of women in the near West Side neighborhood. But the most powerful story of all was the story of the milk caps. These foil caps from Polk's Dairy were an entree to talk about Riverside Amusement Park located on the White River just north of 30th Street. It was a segregated park, with the exception of special days sponsored by Polk's Dairy when African Americans were allowed in with discounted admission if they brought in milk caps. These objects, seemingly innocuous and even nostalgic to many museum visitors, evoked strong emotions for those who remembered the exclusion. For example, a visitor to the exhibit tracked down my email somehow and wrote to tell me that she stood in front of the case and wept. These simple objects connected with people. Even though the memories were painful, they felt seen and heard in the middle of a museum that purported to tell the Hoosier story, but at that point had demonstrated little interest in centering Black people's voices and experiences. So thank you, Paul, for showing me the power of objects to tell stories. They can help us, as Paul has said, quote, to engage folks in conversations about challenging histories that many people would just as soon forget. They can also touch our hearts, help connect us to the richness of diverse experiences and to grapple with the emotional and material consequences of racial injustice. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon. Hi, Andrea here. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, for the spring semester of 2019, Paul and I were awarded an IAHI grant to create a class that focused on racial displacement and urban transformation in downtown Indianapolis. It was in an effort to celebrate and critically reflect on the 50th anniversary of the IUPUI campus. We partnered with Kisha Tandy from the Indiana State Museum. And previously, Kisha and I had worked on preserving the physical archive and a virtual reality rendering of the Bethel AME Church, the oldest black church in Indianapolis. The congregation began in 1836 and remained downtown until 2016 when the church was sold to become the Homewood Suites Hotel we see today, right across the street from IUPUI's IT building. My work with Bethel is what first connected me to Paul. Someone said to me, if you haven't talked with Paul Mullins yet, do so today. 
I reached out right away and that led to much knowledge sharing and the eventual and eventually this course. The image you see of the IUPY parking lot uh, with the two residential holdouts is one that Paul often includes in his talks. He tells a story of the Johnsons and the Reinholds desire to hang on to their homes and their community. This image is fitting as a large focus of the course involved the students researching the residents who once lived near where we now work. Indiana landmarks in the early 70s took photos of the homes that once lined the streets of our campus and the surrounding area. They allowed the Heron Art Library to digitize the collection of the photos and make them available online. Danita Davis, through extensive research, provided metadata, including geolocation of the images on an interactive map of today's Indianapolis, along with an overlay of a map from 1908, which most closely resembles the configuration of the streets prior to IUPUI's development. <clears throat> Each dot on the map represents one of the homes that the students researched in our course and links to the digital exhibits they created. I encourage you to sit and visit the site and read about some of the families and businesses that were once a part of this vibrant community. I posted a link to the exhibit page in the chat for you. This is an example of one of the exhibits created by the students, well, part of the exhibit. Uh, in an interest of not cutting away to the internet, I only included some screenshots. The students relied heavily on the city directories and the Indianapolis Recorder, a newspaper founded in 1895 and continues today. Without the recorder, much valuable history regarding African Americans in Indianapolis would have been completely and utterly lost. Guest speakers, elders from the community, also provided students with knowledge regarding the people, places, and events of this former community. Bright Street no longer exists today, but in the 70s, the Brown family lived there. The photo from Indiana Landmark and the street address from 1975 were the starting points for the student. From there, they would work with the city directories and the census, and then to the recorder. Students were encouraged to use digital images from primary sources in their narratives. At the close of each exhibit is an image of what stands today in the place of someone's home, in this case, the Browns. If you click on that image of the photo from 75, you can see all the supporting documentation that led to the creation of the exhibit. Towards the end of the semester, Paul and Kisha led the class on a tour of where the homes the students had been researching once existed. It was a deep dive for these students and together we were all inspired by the experience. In addition to working with archives and information technologies, the students got to experience and learn about some of the values that underpins Paul's work. They learned the importance of elders to any community and its history and that they are a treasure trove of knowledge and that through our respect of them, we can truly learn and grow from them. He also emphasized the need to do your homework and learn as much as you can about any community you wish to engage deeply with. Lastly, he stressed the significance of giving back to the community members who share their knowledge with you, that there must be an exchange of expertise and resources in community engaged research. We hope that our digital exhibit is viewed as a giving back. Thank you, Paul, for the opportunity to work and learn from you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for being here today and for this opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Before I begin, I want to say that at the end of my remarks, I will be talking today about very difficult history, but that I will not be showing any disturbing images in my remarks today. I knew and admired Paul's work before I came to IUPUI now more than a decade ago. Although we were trained in different disciplines, I'm a historian, we both study material culture, and so there is a good bit of overlap in the things we are interested in and the approaches that we take to our work. Paul is always unfailingly generous with his research. I often quote something that he said to me a while ago, which is that information wants to be free. Historians are notoriously less than willing to share their research and sources, but Paul's generosity with me has changed the way I think about my own obligations to make my work and resources available and accessible. As an example, his work on the color line in Indianapolis has been a key resource in my own work, and he graciously shared findings and photographs that he allowed me to include in a textbook so that students across the US now encounter the story of those milk caps that Liz has already spoken about today um, in their reading of an introduction to public history textbook. 
It has always made me laugh that some of our work uh, is genuinely complimentary, both in print and in real life. Um, a lovely pairing here of coffee and donuts. Um, my work on Mr. Coffee on the left and Paul's fantastic book about donuts on the right um, and our love of occasionally investigating really hard hitting stories uh, that matter today. But what I admire most um, about Paul in our ongoing work together is his deep commitment to work in the local community. Dan Hicks, a British archaeologist and a curator at the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford, opens his recent book, The Brutish Museums, with a discussion of the Dig Where You Stand movement. This movement grew out of a 1978 book which encouraged workers to study the untold histories of their workplaces from their unique vantage point as employees and insiders at these institutions. Hicks does this with the Pitt Rivers in his book, The Brutish Museums. And Paul has been at this work here in Indianapolis for IUPUI. When I read Hicks for the first time a couple of years ago, I immediately thought of Paul's work here on campus and in the city. He has both literally and figuratively dug where he stands here in <laughs> Indianapolis, and in doing so has made a huge impact. Paul's work to bring IUPUI toward acknowledgement and reckoning with the Black community whose land and homes the university dismantled as it created and then increased its footprint stands in my mind as one of his greatest accomplishments. Paul and I didn't really begin to work together until the early days of the pandemic when I joined a local organization in Indianapolis, the Indiana Remembrance Coalition, where Paul had already been providing significant leadership. This community group is working to move Indianapolis toward a deeper understanding of our state's history of anti-Black racial violence and terror. Paul had uncovered the story of a young man, George Tompkins, who had died in 1922 and whose death had been ruled at the time a suicide, but who had actually been the victim of a racial terror lynching. The Indiana Remembrance Coalition and Paul connected around George Tompkins' story and Paul worked closely with them in developing a plan to memorialize Tompkins on the 100th anniversary of his death, both through a major event held in early 2022 that drew national press attention. It was held at Floral Park Cemetery to mark the placing of a headstone at Tompkins' grave, which had been unmarked up until this point, and also through a unique initiative with the Indianapolis Coroner's Office to petition to have George Tompkins' death certificate corrected a century later and the cause of death be changed from suicide to homicide. On this next slide, you can see the original verdict on Tompkins' birth, a death certificate, uh, the verdict in 1922 of suicide. And then on the next slide, uh, you can see um, at the memorial event in early 2022, uh, one of Indianapolis's coroners making the announcement and showing there to the gathered crowd uh, that the cause of death had been changed as of 2022 for George Tompkins' death certificate to um, homicide. Um, this was an amazing moment at this memorial service. Um, I think probably more than 150 people were in the room. And uh, when the coroner made this announcement, it was the first Time it had been announced publicly, the crowd spontaneously rose and gave a standing ovation uh, to the change in this death certificate. It was a powerful moment uh, to be able to witness. Paul's commitment to indie history, uh, his curiosity, and his deep respect for community partners resonate throughout all of his work, um, and I am so thankful to be a part of that work alongside him. Well, thank you all of our panelists for taking time to share how Paul's work has impacted you and the work that you do in your partnerships and beyond with students and with community. I am overwhelmed by uh, hearing how this work has made such a huge difference in so many different ways and appreciate that you all have been able to take some time to share with us uh, the breadth and depth of this work. And this is a different sort of format than what we've done typically in our Scholar of the Month programs, where typically we hear from the scholar themselves. They set the stage. We have some conversation. But in looking back at the uh, the importance of the Bantz Fellowship Program and the 
deep appreciation for this work and what has happened, we felt like this would be a great way to share the work in a broader way and then invite folks who uh, are in attendance who may want to say something. And in fact, it's possible that um, the man himself, Paul Mullins, is here and may wish to make some comments too. And so we certainly would invite that as well as others who may want to say something. So Paul, are you here? Do I hear you in the background? You hear me in the background. Well, please, we're so glad that you're here, and I hope that you've uh, been able to appreciate this amazing amount of uh, information and the impact that you've made, and, and we're glad that you're here and want to hear what you have to say. I can't say that I've gotten the images to run um, from, my, from here, so I'm sort of like my grandma <laughs> in that respect, but... Um, I would like to first of all thank all of you that um that appeared here. Um you you you, you made me sound better than I thought. <laughs> so I'm really ha happy. Um I would like to say that um this is always as you guys understand it's always a, a collective e effort and you have to have so many people to pull off a project and it hel helps that i was willing to push the project but i couldn't have done that without all of you and tons of other people so i'm really um i'm thankful to being um working with all of you and i will say that um once upon a time People said to me, oh, my Lord, you're going to IUPUI. Um, how could you, po you we'll, we hope that you'll have another, uh, you'll go to another place. And I could not be more happy than to have spent 20 years plus here. It just was perfect. It was ideal for my scholarship. It was ideal for um my 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 emotional support to be honest you know people just cared about me and cared about my work and i think that many of you feel the same way well, thanks Paul, we steve want, we want to thank you for uh tolerating us presenting <laughs> this in this way and um allowing us to share this because there's just so much deep work and deep appreciation and and for you being the pusher of this i think that's been all of our experience on campus is that you are always you've always been somebody who's been pushing us to the next level and inviting yeah. that conversation and making it possible and so i'm so glad that you stayed and you're part of this amazing place that we have where we can have these conversations and push and push ourselves to explore and to dig deeper so thank you Again, thank you for being here. Yeah, there's lots of comments about um, the amazing work that you've done and the partnerships that we have together, but we do want to open it up if there are others who would like to say something and share um, something beyond what we've already heard or an anecdote that fits. And I would ask if you don't mind to maybe use the raise your hand button so that we know, or we'll try to keep track here. Um, I know that it looks like um, uh, Dr. Vance and Dr. Petronio are unmuted. Did you want to make a comment? Before we yeah, get started, I, I, one uh, one observation I want to add: no one said this unless I missed it. Uh, this was an incredible example, also, of the importance of the liberal arts. Uh, we don't say that often at IUPUI, probably not often enough. <laughs> uh, but this was exactly an illustration uh, of the importance, and that. The liberal arts really do apply. Uh, could we have any more deep example than the excavation of the history of our own community and the people in these communities uh, than what we've seen? Um, so I wanted to add that to the conversation and the contribution that you all have made doing this work. Thanks. Well, Charles, it's no, it's it's good to notice that uh, the first 
Bance Fellow was in fact awarded to scholars from the School of Liberal Arts to uh, reinforce the point that you just made. And I think it's important for our colleagues to know that afterwards, uh, when, when our fellows uh, engage in that work, it's not the end, it's not just a one and done, but they stay involved and we ask them to do a lot of things. And both Sue and Paul have been amazing partners in a lot of the other work that we do in the Center for Translating Research into Practice. They helped us for a couple hey. of years engage uh, a couple of keynote hey. address folks to come in and uh, share their work. So it was amazing. It's been amazing what they've been able to do. And and so it does highlight the value and importance that um, all of our schools bring to our campus, especially the School of Liberal Arts. Are there other comments or <laughs> reflections? Paul, did you want to respond again? Uh, no, I was listening to Mr. Ridley in the background, actually. Oh, okay. That's what that play was. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that's who the... <laughs> I'm sure he has a, a comment in a moment. Okay. All right, Leslie, ATN, you have unmuted. Did you want to say something? No? Yes. Yes, go ahead. I'd like... Good evening, everybody. Hey, Paul. Um, I'd like to tell everybody about the time I made a mistake of going on a bike ride with Paul Mullins. <laughs> so we apparently find out <clears throat> that we live around the corner from each other. I could walk to Paul's house. He could walk to my house. I find out he likes to ride bikes. I enjoy riding bikes. Um, and I said, all right, cool. I'd like to go on a bike ride with you. Sorry, man, let's do it. Paul shows up uh in full bike regalia right he has his uniform on <laughs> i'm in a nike shirt nike shorts uh i got my hat paul comes rolling up i look at my wife i said okay if i don't come back in a while just call 911 because this guy says so paul turns me every which way but loose we're riding all over the place. And while we're doing it, I realize he's clicking his feet into these into this bike. So I think this is a serious bike, right? So he's clicking his foot into this. This is one of those speed bikes. I have like a hybrid, you know, just a thing, right? Like uh, you might as well like a Huffy or something. And so he's pointing, he'd unclick his feet and point out little dangers. So there's a pothole here and he'd un I'd hear the click and I'd look down at his foot and he's pointing out this danger and we're going all over the place. So I'm huffing and puffing. I'm half dead. We get to a hill. And by the time he gets to the top of the hill, I've already gotten off my bike. I'm walking it up this hill. And so I get to the top of the thing. And I thought to him, I said, Paul, how old are you? And he told me. And I realized this dude is like 10 years older than me. <laughs> right. And I said, OK, well, I think from now on, I'm going to ride my bike all by myself in this neighborhood. I'm no longer going to do it with Paul Mullins uh, to be embarrassed. Paul, we love you, man. Well, thanks for sharing that story. And and that, along with what I'm reading in the, the chat, if you have a chance to see all the comments that are there, is another important piece of what I hear Paul has been so good about and his work is developing relationships because as he mentioned you know you can't do this alone it it can't just be one person doing this it, it takes the power of the community working together and so it does take effort and uh work to to be in relationship at all levels so even riding a bike could be a way that we build relationship with one another and i see other comments about how paul has been inspiring, has walked with folks, has offered opportunity. At the same time, he's been nudging and pushing. And you can't do that if you're not in a good relationship with somebody. So um, I just want to acknowledge that. I think that's an important piece of how I've experienced Paul and how many of you are experiencing him as well. Who else would like to make a comment while we have this opportunity here? Um, this is Paula Brooks. And I just want to mention that for me, I've known Paul um, almost as long as he's been here, but I wasn't living here in Indianapolis, And but we forged a, a friendship and a relationship, and he trusted me with some historical papers um, 
which I still have to this day. I, I was really honored with that. And I think he just recognized that I had a, a, a deep, deep um, obligation to make sure that the history of, of my family and, and the people who live down here um, was correct, um, given the fact that that narrative um, would say that we were basically the dregs of society that were left down here and, and that our agency um, was not important um, in the continuation of the, the um, history of, and heritage of the area. So, Paul, I really appreciate um, what you've done. Because as a, a, for whatever reason, in this state, um, there's been Black people who have um, done what Paul has done, um, maybe not at the same level or, or with the same academic credentials. And um, it basically f fell on deaf ears. But Paul was able to come in um, being um, white and, and being from the um, cradle of the Confederacy. I think that that really helped him to tune in to our pain and trauma and, and to try to help um, humanize, humanize us. So I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing that example, along with some other examples of how Paul's been able to help share the stories, bring them to life, and, and make them real, and, and then many times correct it, right, to make it accurate. So thanks for sharing that. That's important for us to hear. And, and to acknowledge that there are uh, histories that we need to maintain and take good care of, and so that they're accurate. Are there others that wish to share something while well, we have this opportunity? I see Tom Ridley has unmuted. Did you want to say something, Tom? Well, <clears throat> hello. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say hello to Paul, if I could. And uh, sure. Paul and I worked together for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, many times uh, throughout the Ransom Place area. And I, we got to be great friends. I think I'm... Often he was at my 100th birthday party about a month ago. So uh, we, we're close. And I think of him as adopted brother, more or less. <laughs> we, uh, we think alike. And that's what's so great. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, for all you've done for me, as well as for the neighborhood and the community. Well, that's very... That's an enormous uh, flattery. There's so many of you guys that I'm, I'm, that I'm relying on. You know, just in the screen, just in the screen, Edward and it, um, Rhonda, Liz. I mean, these are all um, Leon. You know, you guys have have all been been kind of the jumping the platform for what I do. And I just want to point out that I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I'm gonna <laughs> I plan to <laughs> my plan is to survive this. <laughs> well now that you poison. you're already you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So that's good. You're pushing us today. <laughs> Paul, we just want to give you your flowers while you're here and let you know how much we care about you, how much you mean to us. I mean, you have been one of the the, the key and, and biggest influences on my time here, on my work here. And, and just um, as Paula and, and Mr. Ridley were saying, making the Black people in Indianapolis feel like they matter. We have a voice, we had a life, the, the, our dreams, our wants, our desires were important. And so we want you to come back so you can continue to do this work to, to make these invisible stories and populations visible. 
I mean, I'm so impressed that you have had such an influence and looking at my colleagues sort of talk about you and the influence you've had on the discipline. I just love it. So you got to come back now. So yes, you're going to survive this and you're coming back and it's going to be all good, sir. All right. We know all right. it. It only took me, it only took me, me and my wife, like the half, this, the, almost the full session to finally put my face to, to the voice. <laughs> Anyone else like to say something while we have this opportunity? Share an, act, an anecdote or another example? I think it's good for Paul to hear these things so he knows what else we need to work on. I'll add a comment. My name is uh, Mark Warner, and I'm a, uh, and I have a comment and an observation. Um, most of you don't know me. I'm not a part of the IUPUI community. Uh, I was a colleague of Paul's in graduate school going back to 1988. So we've worked together for 35 years. Um, first of all, the personal observation was Paul was great to have as a peer in graduate school because it sort of much like the bike metaphor you sort of felt like you had to keep up with him um you know i finished my degree we started at the same time paul finishes in 96 i finished in 98 paul writes a 700 page dissertation i write a 300 page dissertation you spent your whole time saying i got to keep up with paul um so that's the that's the personal observation and i think that's been true through in some regards my whole whole career uh, the second piece, the broader observation on what Paul has done is, um, I've also gone into academia. I'm at the University of Idaho, and you know we live in a world now where people are deeply suspicious about higher education, and skeptical about the relevance of of college degrees and so on. And I think what's important and it's been demonstrated in this session, has Paul has sort of spent 25 years showing the relevance of you know the, the the linkage between universities and communities and that it is not uh you know blowing up the ivory tower method uh model um this is work that is immediately you see 20 years of relevance to a community outside of the metaphorical gates of of iupui and i think we need more of that in academia and i think this is a great model so I just, you know, wanted to put that out there as a as an observation from someone who's both a friend and a, a colleague, going back a, a long ways. I mean, this is what academia should be. Thank you for sharing that, Claudia Polly. I see that you have unmuted. Would you like to make a comment? Well, <laughs> I guess that's the uh, the idea is that we've unmuted. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, what I just wanted to say was that Paul was and always is a member of the family. Uh, my mother is Jean Spears, who founded or co-founded Ransom Place uh, just across the street from you guys. And because of Paul, he gave my mother's work so much more depth. He encouraged her because she did what she did in the face of lots of folks uh, who said it was just not important enough. The neighborhood wasn't important enough. The people weren't important enough. And so, because you stood with her, you dug around her, um, you encouraged her to do what she did, which she did with all of her heart, um, with the organization that I'm now, and I'll say gleefully, <laughs> the head of, and that's the Urban Legacy Lands Initiative. We are establishing in your name, Paul, the Dr. Paul R. Mullins Award for Citizen Scholarship, um, because you are the one that bring importance to everything that all of us do and you give every single one of us reason for doing it so um as, as i said to uh to sue hyatt earlier um details soon coming but uh it's your award paul uh because of the work you have done and continue to do through all of us thank you <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for sharing that important news. Paul, I'd like to see you one day soon. Come by or I'll come out to see you. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll drop by your. I'll drop by. <laughs> we'll make plans. <laughs> yeah, we spent a lot of time here sitting there talking. Old times, going back to Center Street and all the old streets over in this west side. You know, Indiana Avenue was always called the West Side when I was a kid. There was the Southwest, but the West Side was Indiana Avenue to us. And you made, you brought Indiana Avenue, the West Side, out and open, and I'm real happy about that. I noticed there's a, a M. Leon that has unmuted. Did you want to say something? That's yes. the name on the screen. Yes, go um, ahead. Uh, Paul, um, thank you. Uh, you've taught me a lot. Um, uh, um, much love for Maryland. And uh, that includes Marlis and Aiden, whom I uh, have been thinking about for the last hour and a half. So I hope for the very best for the three of you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll say a word. Um, after Paul left his, you know, finished his master's program at the University of Maryland, working under Dr. Mark Leone, who just uh, spoke to us, and with uh, um, Mark Warner, he came to the University of Massachusetts, and we were in grad school together there. And I remember the first time noticing Paul was in the fall of 1990. We were in a seminar together, and this really kind of skinny, wiry guy with horn rim glasses that were in the fashion in fashion then came in you know came into the classroom and began speaking up and uh i was like i, I remember i turned to another friend of ours Vin lion callow and i said who is this guy and he said i don't know and i said well we better be friends with him because he's like super smart and uh, paul and i finished our dissertations at exactly the same time summer of 96 we both immediately went off to jobs that we hated. And uh, then Paul came here in 1999. And at the end of 2004, with Paul's encouragement to apply for a position that opened up in the anthropology department, I joined him and the rest of our wonderful colleagues here. And, um, you know, it's certainly always been a move that I've been very grateful for. So thanks for sending me that job ad, Paul. Yeah. There are some other comments in the chat, Paul, that, that um, acknowledge the wonderful hall conversations that you've had and looking forward to those again when you come back. So there you go. You're on the hook for continuing the work as we go forward. I'd like to say one thing. I'm not going to show my screen because I have ugly cry face, but <laughs> I just want to say that Paul has never missed any of my public programs for about a decade. He would always be there in the front row, like a nerd. Sometimes my dad would be there too. Um, but what I enjoyed so much is I always get this like string of stream of consciousness texts from Paul at any of my public <laughs> programs and I save them, the really good ones. Um, sometimes he would, you know, suggest other sources or, you know, give me, you know, compliments, um, but some funny ones back from 2019. That guy did not answer your question. The Marxists are getting restless. Well, I guess it's just me. You led him to talk about inequality, but he did not know it. Good job, you nailed that. And that kind of comment from a professor um, really meant a lot. So thanks, Paul. And I hope uh, you get back to being sassy and can start leaving me texts like this again. I'm sassy already. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that, Jordan. Yeah. And that again gets back to that whole relationship piece, right? Around uh, building those opportunities to encourage each other and to do good work and to always strive for better. So thanks, Paul, for pushing us. Um, I just wanted to say something really quick. Hey, Paul. <laughs> um, I'm one of, uh, Paul is my external committee member. I'm a student uh, in archaeology at SMU in Dallas. And um, his work, has really inspired me. And I hope I'm half the urban and historical archeologist you are when I get out of grad school. And you're awesome. Thank you so much. There's a comment in the chat that um, 
is it says I now drive to work down MLK Drive through Ransom Place to get to campus. So I can see the neighborhood at least in passing. And why? Because Paul talked about Ransom. It's a great gift. So uh, the work lives on and that there's great important work. And now there's an award that will uh, continue to remind us about this great work in the future as well. Well, I think we've had a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate all the things that make IUPUI a great place here today. Uh, we, we are a campus that uh, encourages and draws people that are inquisitive, that want to make a difference, that want to uh, come up with ideas and generate models and, uh, and ideas that can make a difference. And we do that in partnership with those around us. And I think Paul's work is an excellent example of this. It's no surprise that this was uh, part of the initial Vance Fellowship Award, as we said, both Paul and Sue's work are super examples of the work that the Center for Translating in Research into Practice promotes and encourages all the time. And that work as demonstrated today is all about all of us working together and finding um, new ways to do things in different ways and to um, partnering and to making our community a better place. So thank you all for participating today. This has been and is being recorded, so it'll be available to be seen. If you have others who uh, would benefit from hearing how this work goes and, and, and the, as a demonstration for how do we keep doing this in the future, please share that. And as we said earlier, we can't uh, leave out the opportunity that if you are so moved by this and want to see this work continue, there are ways to support it not only by just participating and being a, par a partner in the work, whether you're in the community or on campus or a student, but also with um, other ways, other gifts. So please consider that as you move forward. But I think this is a good time for us to end. Let's thank all of our panelists, but let's thank Paul for his great work and for making a difference in, in our lives and the work that we do. And please join us again. If this is a good time to remind you that we have our annual keynote address coming up just this next week on Thursday evening at the Bonner Center at 6 p.m. And on Friday at noon on campus in the Heron Auditorium, we'll be hearing from Dr. Mark Becker about student success. What, what topic could there be that's better about how to engage our students in, in other ways? And then, of course, we'll do this every month where we'll feature a scholar and explore the ways that their work and partnership makes a difference in our community. So thank you all for coming and have a great day. Paul, thank you. We are, we're going to keep doing it.